This episode of This Agile Life has been brought to you by BrilliantAgile.com, providing agile and scrum training, consultancy, and personnel. BrilliantAgile.com. Done right, it's brilliant. Released on Sunday, June 28th, 2015. This Agile Life, episode 88. Diabetes waiting to happen. The software industry transforms more and more every day. Agile methods are quickly replacing traditional ones. The question is, are you agile enough? This podcast is devoted to agile and lean software development. Time to welcome your agile coaches on This Agile Life. Hello, everyone. I'm the host of This Agile Life, John Sextro. Joining me today, I have two wonderful co-hosts. First up, Nate Mackey, af- back to the show after another long reprieve. Yes, I just keep popping up every once in a while randomly. You know, that's that's the best kind of, of positive reinforcement is the random positive reinforcement. So. <laughs> that's, that's- it's like a little bonbon my wife puts in my backpack once in a while. Exactly. <laughs> And of course, you all recognize that guy's voice. That's Amos King taking a big swig of one of his famous beers. Oh, and I will let you know what that beer is at the end of the show. So stay tuned at the end, deep tease for the famous <laughs> beer pick of the episode. Don't fast forward to the end just to find out. That's <laughs> the whole thing. Yeah, because you, you will miss out on the conversation we have with our special guest, Wes Higby. Hey, John. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to have you on, Wes. I'll tell everybody a little bit about you, and then you can fill in the blanks. Wes has been doing consulting since he was uh, the age of three, I think, is what he said. (laughs) That's how the math works out. (laughs) Yeah. He works through his own company, Full City Tech, and is the author of a book called Commitment to Value, How to Make Technical Projects Worthwhile. And Wes is joining us tonight to talk about that book and introduce us to a number of concepts in his book. So Wes, once again, Welcome to This Agile Life, and thank you for joining us. Yeah, again, uh, my pleasure to be here. Glad to, uh, glad to be on. Do you, do you mind if I start out talking a little bit about the background of the book and share some of my journey? I guess we should probably let you talk a little bit about that first, shouldn't we? Guys, yeah, let, maybe, let the guest yeah. have something to say. Say something first. I, I thought the guests always had to go last. Aw, <laughs> maybe I can have five minutes to talk. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I'm putting you on the clock. Ready? Oh, just kidding. So, Wes, tell us about the book and tell us about value. Yeah, absolutely. My background is in consulting. I've been doing it, stumbled upon it accidentally, didn't really realize what I was getting into and just fell in love with the type of business. Uh, It's just a great opportunity to work directly with people, very closely with people. I feel like I've been fortunate in that capacity in the various jobs I've had throughout the years. Uh, My background's in uh, software development like I think all of us here. And uh, though I'm branching out into new areas as a result of kind of where I've taken this journey uh, that I'll recap here, but, you know, first three or four years of being a consultant, maybe first five or six or seven years, actually, if I do the math right, um, (laughs) uh, things worked really well. seemed like they worked really well. Um, I really enjoyed working with people, uh, had a variety of customers to help. When people would bring things to me, it was uh, a lot of fun to work on the challenging problems they would put in front of us. And uh, it seemed like by and large, we were able to solve the things, uh, solve the problems they brought to us or tackle the opportunities that they put in front of us. Uh, I would say about halfway through my consulting career, I I realized, though, um, something didn't seem right. I think at some point we all notice this when we look back at the work we've been doing and um, we think about what what this work might be worth to more than just ourselves, right? It's easy to keep ourselves busy and to keep our head in the sand and plug away day after day coding or doing whatever it is that's involved in software development. Uh, but it, but I kind of noticed a pattern, if you will, and that was just that a lot of the work that we had done, uh, although there was initial enthusiasm for it, by the end of even small projects of a couple of months it was obvious that there wasn't nearly the level of enthusiasm we began with. And a lot of those projects, uh, even, even a couple of weeks after they were done, if you will, it became obvious that 
nobody was really using the software we had created. That was perplexing. Oh, no. Yeah, right. Nobody ever noticed that happen, right? <laughs> um, another pattern I kind of noticed happening, or maybe this is hindsight thinking back, is that uh, somebody would come to us with a problem and we would, we would work on it. And we would maybe spend a week doing whatever it is that they had cooked up in their mind that they would like to do with software. And we would uh, do a demo or hand it over to them or put it in an actual system, put it live in a production system, only to find out on Monday when we come back to the office uh, after the weekend, there's a slew of changes to make to it, rather substantial changes sometimes, almost as if we're reworking the principle of whatever it is we did in the first place. And not enough that we need to throw out what we had done, but enough that it was kind of obvious that we were redoing something we had already done. And then we would release that maybe a week or two later, um, do a demonstration, whatever it might be. And then maybe, maybe a couple of weeks have passed and we wouldn't hear anything about it. Um, but then randomly some, somebody would pop into our lives, uh, like, like, uh, you, it was Nate, right? You pop on randomly every once in a while. So <laughs> randomly somebody would pop into our lives and tell us, you know, that project we worked on last month, uh, a couple of weeks we spent on, we need to throw all of that out and we need to do something else entirely. And so there's a lot of rework that tended to happen. And as you see this happen year in and year out, it doesn't seem like a lot at the time. It seems almost random, if you will, but you start to notice that it's happening enough that you're kind of worried about it. And of course, in, in the uh, analytical mindset of, a, of somebody that's an engineer like myself and the people I worked with, uh, we tend to look for those patterns and then try to find ways to maybe uh, avoid those failures, if you will, going forward. Um, and maybe failure is a hard word for it, but. Uh, I kind of felt like if we did something once, we did something twice, and it took the third time to get it right, uh, what maybe was going wrong, especially if the third time involves throwing away everything we did in the first two passes of something. Uh, and then in the other, on the other hand, having a project that seems very enthusiastic, that somebody is very excited about, why does it just go unused? Why do we spend three or four months working even very closely with the customer on a project. And then a year later, nobody's using the system. So it led me to wonder if there wasn't something that maybe I should be doing differently about how I worked that would be able to catch these problems when they happened. So I looked for patterns in what was going on. And I tried to then look in the future when somebody would bring a problem to us, I would try to stereotype it based on things that had happened in the past to see if I thought for some reason that whatever it is they had proposed to us was going to fit into one of those situations where we we're going to have to rework everything or it just wouldn't be useful at the end of the day. Uh, and so then I would try in those situations to uh, change something up front to maybe do it right, if you will. Uh, in those situations, sometimes I tried to use what we had learned in the past with another customer. So maybe we had done something that ultimately became successful with another customer. I'd try and stereotype and pick that up and use it for a customer in the future. They're in the same industry, um, maybe slightly different set of customers, but it seems like the same type of project. So I thought they needed the same types of things that that customer before had needed that made them successful. But to no avail, all of these attempts to try and predict what would lead to uh, some form of failure or just software that goes unused. Uh, nothing seemed to work. Nothing seemed to change the nature of the success of projects. Success seemed to be fleeting at best, uh, somewhat random, if you will. Uh, every once in a while, we would get a phone call from a customer to be very excited about what we were, uh, what we had just worked on for them, what we had given them. Uh, I remember one phone call, for example, a customer called up uh, and said they had just saved some ridiculous amount of money. I believe it was like twenty-five or fifty thousand dollars. It was something to me that was substantial. That was like, wow, that's like. That's like what we charge you on a monthly basis. You just save that in a day. That's fantastic. And that felt very uh, rewarding or uh, very encouraging that the work we were doing wasn't just random failures uh, and um, I guess people that just were happy and but didn't say anything about it, but that every once in a while people would say something, uh, give us some unsolicited feedback, if you will. So I wanted to know what 
what causes that random success? Or maybe not what causes it, but what can lead to that random success? And what can maybe help avoid the random failures? And what I, what I found, um, sometimes I refer to this as a, I woke up, if you will. Uh, I found that in all the work I was doing to try and improve the work, the, how the software was created. So focusing on how we created the software. I mean, we got to the point where um, we could turn around a request in a matter of, of 30 minutes, depending on how long it took to actually implement whatever it was in code. So as, long, as fast as we could write code, we could turn that around to our customer. I, I specifically remember an instance where a customer called for, uh, they were late filing their taxes, they needed an extra report. They called up, uh, told us about what they needed in the report. We go grabbed uh, the standard format from the IRS. We plugged it into the system to feed their numbers in. And within a matter of two hours, we were pushing a button and getting some coffee while the software was being released and giving the customer a call to let them know that they had the tax report that they needed to, uh, to file so that they wouldn't be further late filing their taxes. So I mean, we had gotten to the point where we had perfected everything about how we went about creating the software so that there weren't any delays in that process. We removed as many efficiencies as we could find in that process. Um, and we just tried to work very closely with our customers to give them exactly what it was that they asked for as fast as possible. So wasn't that a great success that you were able to turn that around so quickly for your customer? You, you say that as if it was almost a, yeah, a bad I thing. Say, I say that as if it was a bad thing because it didn't fix the fact that success was still fleeting. Um, it was, uh, it, the failure still happened as often as they, as frequent, the same frequency because we are faster, so we can turn stuff around faster now. So we can produce much more than we could before. But if you could imagine, and one of the reasons why I, 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 um, I was very happy about that at one point in my life. And now that I look back, it's not that I'm um, unhappy about it, but that I don't see it as uh, beneficial as I did at that time was if you think of a process, right? If you think of a process that generates some percentage of failure, right? And we scale that process up without doing anything about the percentage of failure that we generate, then we're just, uh, we might have had, sometimes I like to refer to it as a junkyard, right? Every once in a while, something spits out of the process that's just garbage. You have to throw it in the backyard and it sits there <laughs> while the rest of your family nags you about it the rest of your life. Uh, you kind of amass, amass a little bit of a junkyard. If you take that process that does that, though, uh, and you put it on steroids, so like if you, uh, my mom, sometimes I give my mom a hard time for hoarding stuff. If I were to give her $50,000 and tell her to go have fun shopping, um, her hoarding <laughs> would be put on steroids. She'd go from a junkyard to a landfill in no time. And so that's why when I look back at that process, well, it was a great thing that really helped us do some interesting, unique things that were very beneficial to customers at time. It also enabled us to do some very destructive things as well. So it also enabled us to consume a lot of, um, uh, a lot of our customers' resources very quickly without producing anything to show for it. And it simply was because the, that awakening that I talk about, um, I like to think of it as like an awakening because you could think of it as immediate, but it really took this probably took the span of several months. Maybe even it was over the course of a year. I don't remember again, hindsight. I like to look back and sometimes speculate how I got to where I am and just realize that there's no way I'm going to recreate those memories. But, um, well, it, uh, it sounds like Wes, what you're saying is that your awakening was to realize that it was important not always to just give the customer what they asked for, but give the customer what it is that they really wanted and maybe weren't articulating to you. Yeah, yeah. So what I realized was while we had how we went about um, creating software and while we worked very closely with customers to uh, understand a lot about their business, actually, um, to the point where we could give them feedback about things that they hadn't considered. What was missing was a focus on what any of what we were doing was worth. And I think a lot of us take for granted, especially uh, just the power dynamics and culture, that uh, there's a difference between helping somebody and being subservient, if you will. Uh, helping somebody is extremely controversial, actually, in comparison. Um, that simply listening to what somebody would like you to do 
to take a request, if you will, from somebody for, for help uh, can actually do harm. And that doing whatever somebody asks for then isn't necessarily, it's kind of the difference between what somebody might want and what somebody may actually need. And maybe a really good example of this, just the other day I was, uh, I had a headache and my nose has been a little bit congested. I don't know what it is, but I got, I was just frustrated because it's like the fourth day of this. So I walked out into the living room. Um, I'm, I'm staying with family right now. And I said, do we have any ibuprofen in the house? And of course there's no ibuprofen in the house. So, uh, uh my mother-in-law says, well, how about some, uh, Tylenol? And I'm not a big fan of acetaminophen. So I, I said, no, Tylenol doesn't work for me. And, and after I said that, then, um, she said, well, what's wrong? And I said, well, I've got a headache. Um, my ears been kind of, con or my ears feels kind of plugged up and I've been kind of congested and she could relate to it because she was having similar symptoms herself. And in the process of doing that, she says, well, you know what? I've got some, uh, I, I forget what it is. It's, it's, it's one of those medicines where you combine, uh, I think actually probably Tylenol. So I got the Tylenol that I didn't think I wanted, but it also came with, it probably had like Wafenicin or something like that in it. Um, so it was, it was actually what it was actually, you know, I might've been able to take some ibuprofen, but, and that might've made me feel a little bit better for the time being, but this one actually helped me uh, tackle the, the actual cause of the problem, which was the congestion. So, so this well, is, this is a common thing that I see is that, uh, you go to somebody, uh, uh, whether it's a customer or even us, we go to somebody and tell them the solution we want, not the problem that we have and letting them solve that for us. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, just like in this case, I, what I what I thought I wanted and I, I, I knew that, like, I probably wanted more than ibuprofen, but I just saw ibuprofen as a quick fix. Right. What I was better for me was to have something to help with the congestion. Um, yeah, it's it's uh, it's it's and it's I sometimes like to remind people it's not a bad thing at all that when we need help, we have a tendency to have a somewhat of a clouded mind actually at times because we're focused on what we need help with. And we sometimes will jump to a conclusion about what we need help with. Sometimes we will propose something that uh, there may be a, a better alternative to. Um, sometimes someone else has proposed something to us and it just sounds like a good idea. If we take that to somebody and just hand it to them and they just go forth with it, what comes back may not be what we need. And it may actually do harm. Um, in the case of a customer, it may consume a lot of resources. Uh, or there may have been a missed opportunity, actually, like with the medicine. Uh, there's a missed opportunity for me to not only tackle the, the pain, but also uh, tackle the congestion as well. So there's opportunity in that we may miss. There's harm as well. Uh, sometimes I like to refer to this uh, myself when I reach out to people in a customer relationship, if you will. I like to, th I like to think sometimes, if, could I step back and how could I make this relationship so that I'm thinking more about what I need, less about what I want. And how can I get that other person to help me figure out what it is I need? And this can be in any type of, of relationship. It could be simply going to get a haircut. A lot of times they'll ask you what type of haircut you want. I'm not the type of person that's that picky. I don't know what's in style. So I may say do it this way, but I, I also would just love them to take some liberty in asking, uh, in asking me maybe some variations on it and if if i don't know what those variations are go ahead and pick or help me figure out what the variations are that i might like but i think there's a, a beauty actually when we reach out to people for help and allowing them to be a consultant in the capacity to figure out what we need before they give it to us yeah and and i i think that's the one of the reasons why agile software development processes have come into um, fad as of late or have become all the rage, if you will, because they do give you the opportunity to do that actual consulting work where you get to uh, design a solution. You're not just creating some sort of programming something from a spec. And even if you are, we're going to do that in a way where uh, you would be able to turn software around very quickly and gather that feedback. And I think what we're really talking about is being adaptable to uh, to, to change so that if a customer does want something and you show them, hey, this is what we created that you asked for, they would be able to quickly say without expending a lot of their resources with a lot, a lot of their money, 
that, oh, well, that's, you're right. That's what I asked for. But what I really needed to do is this, that, and the other, uh, and, and quickly get to that rather than drawing out a long process of gathering requirements and then building something and then spending a ton of money and having really nothing to show for it because it doesn't do what you want. So it, this sounds to me like it's a big part of this is adapting to change. Would you agree with that? I, I would. I would take it a step further because I, one of the, you know, one of my, I, I think the opportunity to do this has always been there, regardless of the techniques that somebody practices. Um, I think absolutely the key is, is the ability to adapt to change. But I don't think that that goes far enough simply because, um, you know, one of the problems I see a lot with people even that apply agile um, principles and practices in the work they do is one of two things. It turns into either an excuse not to plan and and not to really think about anything but what's going to happen in the next two weeks or three weeks or four weeks, whatever their cycle is. Um, and and, and the, second, the second thing I see a lot of is, is people recognize that or like to talk about this thing called scope creep. And I think it's an attempt to address scope creep because we really don't have any other way to deal with it. We feel like it's just such a... Um, constant, if you will, in our reality. But I really see that uh, even working incrementally on something to break it apart. So, you know, if you're a compare and contrast waterfall planning six months or a year and supposedly not breaking the plan at all versus planning two weeks at a time or three weeks at a time and not breaking that plan at all. Um, I don't see much difference in those two styles because either of them haven't got at the heart of what the problem is. And that's what is necessary to move from a relationship where we subserviently take requests from anybody, whether it's a stakeholder in the business that has, that's a hippo, you know, the person with the highest paycheck, right? <laughs> or it's, uh, or it's somebody's bright idea on the engineering team because they want to try out some new technology or they've come to some conclusion themselves about what this customer needs based on what a past customer needs. That's, that's a fault I had. Um, or it's a customer asking for something because they're frustrated in the moment and they feel like the software should work the way they want it to work and it doesn't work the way they want it to work. And so they send something off <laughs> in a fit of uh, anger and somehow it becomes a part of the work that somebody ends up doing. Uh, so I think, I think it's actually, it, it has to be a step beyond. We always have to be adaptable to what we do. Uh, I think the larger problem I faced was, and I think a larger problem a lot of people face is taking the time to move from a subservient relationship with whoever is generating the work we do into a helpful capacity where we do no harm. And that may mean doing nothing if we can't ensure that we are going to do no harm. All right, let's have Nate get in here, and he's he's chomping at the bit to get get some stuff across. So let's hear from Nate. Yeah, yeah. You, 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 it's funny that you mentioned do no harm at the end there because it it makes me think about the doctor patient relationship where, um, and to some degree that goes the other way, maybe a little too much. But you know, you walk into a, a doctor and you're having a problem of some sort, and you really have no idea how to fix it. Uh, and maybe, maybe you do because you did some internet research or you talked to a friend who seemed to have the same problem. And so you think you might know what the answer is, but if the doctor just listened to you and said, well, okay, uh, what do you think I should do? What do you want me to do to fix it? <laughs> that would be a terrible idea. You know, I had a doctor do that once actually, but that's a side story. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so that's not really what you want. What you want is the doctor to work with you, I mean, ideally to apply their expertise to say, okay, here's a range of things that we could do. Um, all of them have risks, all of them have costs, you know, which of these makes sense or to say, you know, what, what is wrong is very clear and this is what it is. And I and explain to you exactly what's going to happen and get your, your buy-in and your understanding about it, but really use their expertise to solve the problem and not just do whatever you know, not just act like you said, it's subservient and just do whatever you say. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. It's that the next step up, if you will, is to move into that doctor patient model where you are um, taking the time to do some diagnostic work, which can't be 
uh, it can't be that bad of a thing. Actually, I found that the diagnostic work is usually pretty simple and they're questions we eventually ask anyways. Sometimes it's nice to get them out of the way up front. Uh, uh, yeah, and one time, and maybe this is some of your hesitation with this model too, I did have somebody throw back at me, well, you know, one time a doctor gave me, gave my, I think the person said that given their father a bad, um, uh, I guess, prognosis for their outcome or whatever it might be. Uh, and they had gone to another doctor, they had done some research themselves and then gone to another doctor to get a second opinion, and then they got the opinion they wanted. <laughs> and uh, so it was kind of like throwing this back in my face, like, well, you just can't trust people that claim to be experts. And no, you can't, uh, because a big component of of this step in the next direction is also what does it take to build the types of relationships with the people that we're going to be helping so that they trust us and will divulge the information that's necessary to do the proper diagnosis and lead to the proper prescription uh, whether that's a feature in software or uh, a medical treatment, trust becomes a big part of that. And and obviously, when you work with a doctor for the first time, there's certainly going to be a period where you have to build some trust, and that doctor also ha that doctor also has to maintain that trust throughout. One of the things I heard you saying, Wes, is uh, that maybe the process doesn't matter so much, and I'd like to explore that a little bit further, because if you if we extend the the doctor. Uh, metaphor here for a second and say, if you went to a doctor and you had a, a, a terrible pain and the doctor told you, okay, well, let's find out more about that pain. So we're going to spend four months uh, analyzing your pain, trying to figure out the source of this pain. But for those four months, you're going to continue to be in this extraordinary pain. You might, uh, you might go and get another second opinion and see if somebody could at least try something, right? Give, yeah. you, give you some sort, okay, yes, we want to find out just enough about it so that we can suggest a course of, of action and treatment. And if that doesn't work, we'll adapt to that. If we can't, if we can't get you some relief, if we can't get to the bottom of what's causing this, we'll, we will adapt, but we're not going to put you through four months of uh, additional pain just so we can continue analyzing it. And I would, uh, I yeah. would, I would equate that back to the waterfall model of you have a pain point as a company and now this consulting firm, the software development group, the, the software development department in your company is going to analyze your pain point for four months, giving you no relief, no solution at all during that time. You have to sit there and continue with that pain. Um, and there's, there's no opportunity to adapt to change during that time because you have nothing to change other than sometimes, a document. Sometimes yeah. you just want to take the ibuprofen. Oh, absolutely. No, and I think any doctor would be negligent not to have identified some, you know, unless we feel like the person has a mental disorder and is not really feel, feeling any pain. Uh, obviously, uh, I like to think of it as um, if you've identified some way that you can help and, it, and it's not going to, you don't have a huge skepticism about how it may harm anybody, then you absolutely jump on the opportunity to provide what I like to refer to as a little bit of value. To give them a little bit, if you will, of a little bit of pain medication in the doc patient doctor scenario while you go about doing a proper diagnostic before perhaps you go into surgery, right? Um, and none of this process, by the way, has to be anything complicated. Uh, what I found actually is a, a few hours of conversation for something that may last three or four months can give you some fantastic insight that will lead you to make some much better decisions throughout that three or four months. And none of it's on the level of um, we need green buttons over here and we need vertical bars here and we need a feature that does this over here. None of it's user stories. None of it's um, uh, anything to do with how the software is going to be created. None of it's to do with anything that the software is going to contain or how the software is going to work. All of it has to do with what type of outcome do we need at the end of the day instead of what do we want right now? In fact, when people come <clears throat> in a consulting capacity, I'm sure you're all familiar with this. Um, people will come with a rather thorough diagnostic sometime of what they think it is they need in the software itself. And um, that actually becomes a big challenge to step back from that point and reshift the focus on the desired impact for the organization. I mean, software is just a small piece 
of what companies are usually trying to accomplish, uh, maybe unless you're Twitter. Uh, but for a lot of companies, software is just a tiny piece of a larger initiative. And having a perspective of that initiative can help uh, engineers actually adapt to the best fit in terms of whatever software may or may not need to be created to make that initiative successful. So, so what are some strategies that you've used in order to um, find out what you need to be working on, how you need to move forward? Yeah. And maybe this is a great time because this is going to, this will springboard into pricing. One of the, one of the reasons why value pricing is a big uh, discussion point of mine is uh, part of the problem was that there was a huge misalignment and there was a huge misalignment uh, and a lot of people that call themselves consultants when they charge by the hour uh, and they develop software under that model. And this is actually where I really noticed when I was taking my journey, right? And I, was, I said I woke up. What really led me to wake up was the problems we had with our hourly billing model. Um, there's a ton of really interesting consequences or maybe not interesting, but really bad consequences that were arising from a system where we were rewarded for effort when our customers wanted results. And it was that dichotomy that led me to stumble upon what a few people are talking about as value pricing and find a tool that I could incorporate into how I work that would force me to be in a position where I had to discuss results. I had to base what I was doing on results. And I no longer allowed myself to price based on effort. So I no longer allowed myself to bill by the hour. I no longer um, allowed myself to do uh, fixed price uh, contracts where the scope is typed out in a ridiculous level of detail. Uh, and instead moved to a model where I listen to what the customers have to say. And this is something that you improve and get better on. But I jumped <laughs> full steam ahead at a model where I had to listen to what customers said to me, I had to try and ask them questions to understand what it is they needed versus what they wanted to so do some of that diagnostic work. And then try to figure out, knowing what they need and a bit of information about why it's worthwhile to them see if there's some way I can be involved for a fraction of that. So see if there's some way I could have 10% of what it's worth to them to help them do it. And if I didn't feel like that was possible, or if I didn't feel like 10% was enough for me to be safe, then that's the type of projects I would just immediately say no to, which gave me uh, an invaluable tool also to help my customer avoid doing things that they really shouldn't be doing. There's uh, a ton of work, uh, even out of the software that did go used uh, with our customers uh, versus the software that went completely unused. There are still, there are still systems where substantial portions weren't, weren't used or just from observation alone, it didn't really seem like um, people were getting much value out of the system, even though they were using it. it, it the use of it just didn't reflect what the expectation was at the beginning. So I think there's a lot of systems where we where something is done that at best might break even. If you look at the cost and you look at some of the benefits after the fact, you'll see break even, maybe 10 or 20 percent margin, uh, maybe 10 or 20 percent loss. Uh, those types of projects now are really easy for me to say no to, because when somebody's describing something to me and they try to articulate why it's important, uh, it can become very obvious that it may be important to them for it may be a pain for them right now today, but it's not going to be a pain again for them in a month because it's just something they have to deal with on a monthly basis. Now, under the hourly model, I would have tackled that and I could have, I might've spent uh, five or $10,000 fixing a problem that only took up half an hour of somebody's time every other week or every other month. And so there's just not a justification to do that. But under the hourly model, I didn't have any incentive, nor did I have the uh, understanding that that's something I should be watching out for so I could have my customers back. 
and help them avoid those projects and steer toward the projects where they would have a significant return and it would be worth the investment. So Nate, I see this uh, striking a number of chords with you and wonder if you have some thoughts. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this is something that, you know, we are a consulting company that charges by the hour for our work. This is something that's always kind of gotten in my craw is that um, even, you know, we, we do things efficiently. We, we try to get better. We try to produce uh, software faster and get rid of things that waste time. But really there's a, the only incentive to that is that we want our customer to be happy with what we do. If we just look strictly at profit, we would want to take as long as we possibly could to get something done. Or we would, you know, not mind if there were wasted time going on because we, we could just say that's what it takes. So it's really just our desire to, to, for quality and for the ability to produce quickly and get the junk out of the way that, that keeps us going down that road. So it's always bothered me. And we've, we've tried something like, um, you know, having the customer pay for value provided, you know, uh, or, or at least for features provided, I should say, I'm not sure that, that we did value the way that, that maybe you, uh, you're thinking of it but for, for features provided rather than for the hour. And there were, there were some interesting aspects to that, but there was also a lot of problems that came along with it. So it's not something we did a lot, uh, but, uh, but definitely I'm, you know, I'm feeling the problem statement there that uh, I think that that makes a lot of sense. It's, yeah. Maybe. It seems, it seems like a real no brainer. If you could, if a company could come to you and say, we want to, we want to, we want to tackle this project and it's going to net us, a million dollars, or it's going to net us, let's say, ten million dollars, right? And you say, "Okay, yeah, um, I would like to get ten percent of that value that I'm going to create for you by writing this particular piece of software." So, how about if I charge you a million? I think every company in the world would nod their head up and down to paying a million to get nine, yep. right? But yep. there's there's really no guarantee to them getting that nine million dollars. So, how do you how do how do you really sell this sort of proposition yeah, which to is, them. And because there's no guarantee, that's why you're not taking 50% of it. Um, business is definitely about risk. And one of the really good things that happens under a pricing model where you are, and, and that was a glorious, great way to talk about it. It is an oversimplification. And I don't know if we have time to talk about all the nuances of it, but it is a great way to phrase it. Look, $10 million is some theoretical number some some tangible and intangible way to net up what this is worth. 10% of it is this. We know whatever we're going to have to do, we can get you what you um, need, what we've helped you diagnose that you need, by the way. Um, so that $10 million, believe me, that takes a trusting relationship to be able to talk about even numbers. That's, that's something that uh, takes some time. And you have to show that you're not out to... Um, to do harm, if you will, because um, obviously people could take some of that information and do bad things. So you do have to work on that relationship part, but that's also necessary because that's necessary to do the diagnostic as well. When that all happens, though, when you can demonstrate that um, you have a good relationship and there's some trust there and you can talk about these significant pains that, or the significant opportunity uh, with a with a 10 million possible return for them and a million for you and there's no way you you just couldn't make that happen for them. Um, it becomes a very, uh, it becomes a very rewarding situation for both parties involved. Uh, and there can be some substantial profits for both parties involved, which is good because those profits absorb what's unknown. And there's not only unknown for the customer, there's unknown for the provider as well. I mean, we all know that, um, or we all have a fear of scope creep. Interestingly, I will say scope creep is rather mythical. It doesn't really exist. Uh, it's mostly a function of, of billing by the hour, actually, or, or focusing on effort as at the root of it all. But uh, there is still unknown in every project. And I think that's the beauty in the project because I think that's what gives you the ability to do what's necessary and not what is the first thing that comes to mind. Well, uh, but, but, I was just going to say, I think scope creep also, you know, it is part of billing by the hour, but it's also a result of not thinking about value when you ask for things. Yes. Um, yes. Because we, what, what we find a lot that, that will settle into, especially with customers who are not familiar with how software development works, 
is that if we just kind of go with the model with we'll do whatever you say and we'll prioritize whatever you want and we'll just keep delivering to make you happy, is that they will, you know, sit on the login screen forever, just getting it exactly the way you want. <laughs> Pixel so perfect. Happy. Right. And <laughs> and just on and on and let's let's add this and let's add this because they're not thinking, you know, big picture about everything. They're just thinking, oh, yeah, good. Well, I can ask for whatever I want. So yep. it's the same idea that if you're if they can just, you know, if they're just in the candy store with a shopping spree, then they can go, you know, fill up their basket with all this candy. But, you know, at the end, then realize that was a terrible idea. Um, if you're they're thinking about value and what is this really going to do for you? then that's a completely different proposition and they can, it can help them make better choices. Absolutely. So I, I've, I've actually heard, I think it was David Hannemeyer Hansen who said it, um, was that people really don't want choices and, and you, you give them a lot of freedom whenever you say, we'll do whatever you want a la carte. You just have to keep paying us. And you give them so much freedom that they, it's hard for them to come back in and focus on what really needs to get done, like Nate was saying. Yeah. Yeah, and I'll they, say, I can see from my background working with, um, I mean, we all have to work with somebody to help us out in our businesses. Um, I'm not hiring somebody to develop, you know, thousands of hours of software, but, um, but I do work with people and I do realize that there are people that I've worked with where they, their focus was on, or they build by the hour. And as a result, they tend to think a lot about the time they were putting into what they were doing. And we talked a lot about, um, or they had a tendency to talk a lot about in terms of time. Like I'll spend two hours doing this and we'll see what happens. I'll spend three hours doing this and we'll see what happens. The focus shifted on both of our part to the effort involved. Um, or more appropriately, the focus wasn't forced in the case of um, I've seen plenty of customers, Nate, like you're talking about where uh, it's the candy store. So the focus wasn't never forced on what was valuable and it was just whatever we came up with. And then giving them the add in the capacity to be every two weeks reprioritizing and figuring out what to do next. And it was just uh, diabetes waiting to happen. (laughs) And yeah, so yeah, there's a, there was nothing in my model. So that's why I really liked switching to a pricing model where I, it, it, and for a long time, it was like, wow, I could just, I could just bite my tongue and I could just do this work and I could send them a high hourly rate. They probably would be fine with it. And it would be good money for me and everything would be peachy except for the fact that I would hate what I was doing throughout because I wouldn't have any understanding of what it was worth to them. And I would always wonder if ultimately I was causing some harm to my customer. And yeah. this, I think there's a tremendous amount of motivation for a development team if they understand what the value is of what they're creating and what, what difference they're really making. Yeah. And one of the things that that matures out of that is our, first off, I I think that our ability to diagnose value and to prescribe proper solutions is is severely um, underdeveloped as a result. The more we just take what people bring to us and do it, um, we just, we never build the skill to be able to quickly diagnose. Uh, And that's not like a doctor when you walk in takes more than maybe five or 10 minutes most of the time. And sure, they're taking a gamble a lot of the time because they don't know 100%. Uh, but they're, they're making a cost-benefit analysis in their head of doing four months of diagnostic or just seeing what happens with this medication. You, you, so that skill is underdeveloped in, in even engineers. And I think that's such an important skill for everybody to have. It's not just engineers that need to be pushed in a corner and told to do it this way and not given the opportunity to have some input into the process to say, you know what? My gut tells me that that's going to be horribly complex. So unless you're talking about something that's substantially valuable, perhaps we should steer a course in another direction. So, so I have a question. Where does UX come into play then? Um, you know, and so for an example, I'm, I'm imagining if, if, if a customer wants us to build um, a social networking site, how do we apply those principles and end up building Facebook and not MySpace. You know, you know what <laughs> yeah. I'm saying? Yeah. Uh, I definitely think that um, one of the, maybe, maybe a couple of things. Are you asking like, how do you, yeah, how do like you, find, how do you just looking at value? How do you put a value on good user experience? How, how, uh, how, how can yeah. You- so, 
so I see, so when the, the way I've engaged projects now is thinking bigger than the software itself. And for a lot of companies, that's a bit frustrating because they're used to working with providers and, you know, you hire the plumber to do the plumbing, you hire the electrician to do the electrician, but we need to, uh, we, some, there's talk of cross-functional cross-functional goes beyond just multiple uh, engineering talents. It goes to everybody involved in making a project successful. And I start to look at not only my own involvement, but my customer's involvement as well. And thinking about the ultimate outcome isn't to have in software installed and people using it. The ultimate outcome is for a piece of software to help somebody find problems that are going unnoticed with patients. And so the interface is designed to allow them to do that. And it may be somewhat nuanced for the particular people that are going to use it. Um, and so involving those people is a great thing is up front, you know, you're looking at a, a substantial set of profit for yourself, not just for the customer, such that whatever UI work has to be done. Well, first off, you're making the decisions. So you probably can make a better decision up front, knowing the real constraints and you're not going to have. Uh, the constraints evolve on you. If that happens, it's time to go back to the drawing board if the objective of the project entirely changed. Mm -hmm. But um, but as long as you still understand the objective that you help diagnose, well, you get to make the decisions, which means the changes you'll have to make to the UI, if somebody uses it and doesn't find it usable or or whatever the first pass was, just doesn't crack it, um, those changes are not nearly what we think of when we think of scope creep under the model where the customer is driving the bus and managing micromanaging if you will how the software actually behaves looks feels uh operates etc um obviously engineers that, that develop software can develop the skills that a customer would never have right to, okay. to be much I more see. effective at that i think what it sounds like you're saying to me then is that uh although you need the customer on some level to to help you with what value is because they ha know the domain uh there are aspects of the software that you understand the value because of your experience and because you have expertise in what makes good software yep okay yep and i it, that could be different for everybody i mean every relationship is different i've worked with customers that had nobody technical on staff and i've worked with customers that had lots of people technical on staff and those those roles and responsibilities can be can be delegated appropriately, which is one of the really nice things about um, instead of just here's my hourly rate, let's get started, talking a little bit about the uh, objective and diagnosing what's really needed allows you to also say, hey, by the way, we have people that are skilled in these areas of expertise. So you know what? When that type of stuff comes up, we'll take care of it. And that could be on either side of the line. Um, so it could be the customer has somebody that's got extensive uh, experience, user experience or just design expertise, right? Why wouldn't you take advantage of that and allow them to take responsibility for that? They'll, they, they can minimize the risk much better than you can as a provider if you don't have that same level of expertise or vice versa. You might find that the customer is apprehensive about something that every other customer you've worked with is not apprehensive about. So why not step up to the plate and take that risk on and that reward as well? And so there's this opportunity to share some of the risks and rewards and responsibilities ultimately and truly start to form that partnership instead of more of a subservient relationship where those you don't necessarily get the chance to identify those opportunities. Trust has always been such a major component of our conversations on this Agile life. And once again, here we are back to the back to the topic of trust as a, as a way to establish that relationship with a customer to allow you to explore the opportunities of value pricing and of providing a real consultancy based service rather than being that that uh, old school order taker if you will so i'm wondering if maybe you can share some insights uh, into how you have gone through the process of establishing that trust and gaining just enough trust with your customers uh, to start this relationship. I remember when I was a kid, my dad always said, you know, you can't get credit until you have credit. And <laughs> I feel that 
trust is like the same sort of thing. You can't get trust until you get trust. <laughs> right. You know, so how do we how do we get that initial trust? First and foremost, it's it's about looking outward and not inward. So another way I like to talk about some of the changes I've made in the way I think about business is that uh, above all, business is about something. And we have to figure out what that is to each of us. But to me, it, business became about the relationship I have with people. I'm not happy if I'm doing harm. Now, believe me, there are plenty of people that are happy to sell somebody something as long as they're willing to pay for it. I'm not that type of person. So for me, it was a realization what I valued was a long term relationship with people where I know I'm contributing something and not just taking from somebody. So that was important to me that it's about an interdependence, if you will, of business. So the relationship component became very important to me just because that's how I see a, a part of doing business. And obviously, then a part of that relationship component is to be first and foremost concerned about the relationship itself and the trust the respect involved when somebody reaches out to you or when you reach out to somebody and to know that while there may be other things that you or another person want to discuss right away and hop right into, if you even take 30 minutes and just step back and try and listen to what somebody has to say and try and understand a little bit more about where they're coming from, most of this trust and relationship building will just happen by default. And you'll also be given the opportunity to listen for things that will help you diagnose and eventually prescribe some possible uh, alternatives that the customer could pick from. Well, that's great advice, Wes. Thank you. Yeah. And a book I would recommend if I think the person I found that, that describes this best overall is Edgar uh, Schein. He has a couple of books my favorite that I think describes this is a book called Helping. It's a great way to look at everything I've been talking about as far as diagnostic um, and stepping back and, and helping you understand that it is something that eventually becomes somewhat controversial or uh, it is something that uh, eventually becomes um, uh, confrontational with, uh, with an, an opportunity to help somebody. But that's a part of helping somebody that we have to accept if we hope not to do harm in the process. This week's hottest picks. All right, since Wes just gave us a pick, I guess it's time for us to do our picks. Nate, you're up first. All right, well, I've got a couple of uh, retro picks here. Uh, the first one is a book written all the way back in 2001, but uh, although I heard a lot about it, I, I just read it, which is Jim Collins' Good to Great. And for a while there, it was all the rage, and uh, and and it and then there was kind of a backlash against it. And it's kind of funny because the the book is about picking out these companies who uh, had sustained greatness over a period of fifteen years and trying to find the commonalities that that made those companies great. And the, some of the ones that are in there um, are now either defunct or severely shamed. So um, a lot of people like to pick on it, but. What I I really feel like that the concepts are sound and uh, what I what I liked about it a lot of it has to do with the kinds of things we've been talking about here, which is staying laser focused on what it is that is going to make your company uh, the best in the world at whatever whatever that might be, and wrapping every decision around that technology and uh, business decisions and hiring decisions and all of those around that concept. So uh, it was it was really cool to me to read that. I, I think it was helpful, and uh, maybe you know, fourteen years later, it it might be uh, still relevant and might be something people might be interested in. So that's the first one. My second one is an app that's been around for quite a while, but I get a lot of enjoyment out of. It's called Time Hop. And, does this let me time travel? Uh, in a way, it does. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, what it will do is you attach it to all your uh, your social media and to your photos and uh, those kinds of things. And it will show you uh, what you posted or took a picture of one year ago, two years ago, you know, as far back as you might have records. So um, all the way back to seven or eight years ago. And it's really fun to see what was I doing this day, you know, six years ago and see the pictures of your kids and see 
Um, I've, you know, I've always used Foursquare to check into places, uh, mainly for posterity. And so it's cool to see where I went, what I was doing those days. Um, but highly recommended. It's really cool to see all your Facebook posts or your Twitter posts for that day. What were you talking about? So it's a, uh, it's an app. I think it's iOS and Android, but, uh, timehop.com. You always have such great picks. Oh, shucks. Thanks, John. You need to be on more often because you always give me something good to go get and look at. <laughs> All right. Now over to somebody whose picks are questionable. <laughs> Amos. West. West. It's your turn. <laughs> <laughs> I do have another pick, actually, in, uh, uh, as a follow-up pick, if you'd like. Um, uh, somebody, I have not read it yet. I'm, it's on my list to read, but The Halo Effect, as I believe one of the books that picks on good to great. Uh, yeah. interesting it might be an interesting follow up for people too yeah. very good an add on pick <clears throat> thanks Wes you gave me the time to go download time hop I'm feeling very nostalgic <laughs> today I was listening to presidents of the United States the band from the 90s on my way up here tonight um, <clears throat> alright so my is that part of your pick tonight. No, I guess it can be it can be part of my picks presidents of the United States or or nostalgia um i'm i'm guessing from wes's time frame that we're about the same age so he probably knows who the presidents are too Uh, (laughs) so uh my picks for tonight i i apparently uh i've had multiple people come to me and say that every time i'm on i have to pick an adult beverage um which is really putting pressure on me because i live in a tiny town and don't have many choices (laughs) Um, so uh, I, I'm going to pick Mother's Brewing Company, Three Blind Mice. It's a good stout beer from Springfield, Missouri. Um, and they do bottle and ship around, so you might be able to find it in your area. It's really good uh, for for just a, a session drink, and it's not super high alcohol content. So you can just have one and enjoy it and move on. Uh, my, drink responsibly. My se- drink responsibly, that's right. Um, my my second pick is a blog post, Agile Management, How to Manage Microservices with Your Team. Uh, and it's it's pretty neat how it talks about um, development of microservices and how to apply that to an Agile team. And it's got a couple uh, digs on Scrum, so that's why I had to pick it. Who is the uh, author and, on that one? Is that... Uh, uh, oh, uh, uh, I was just wondering if it's Martin it Fowler because he was taking some shots at uh, microservices and uh, as in regards to agile. It, it's Jennifer, Jennifer so Riggins. Definitely not Martin Fowler then. <laughs> um, and, and she discusses that uh, she actually quotes somebody else that warns against using solely scrum because uh, if, he feels it can actually do damage to your technical assets. So I, I just thought that was entertaining. I like the little digs on the scrum once in a while. What's a technical asset? And then is that, that's know. not a, is that the new name for resource? It's not resource. Is it? <laughs> You'll have to read the article to find out. Okay. Uh, and then my last pick is just, I've used them a few times is stickermule.com, and they now have giant wall stickers that you can get and so i got a giant round binary noggin brain that sticks on my wall and looks really nice um maybe i can get a picture to throw into the show notes uh they're they just got fantastic prices quick shipping and beautiful products i'm gonna send you a giant sticker of my head so that i I, I was gonna say the same thing (laughs) Uh, what is what is that company that makes the big wall clings of people because fat head fat head i would totally take a nate and and uh john fathead to sit behind me if you put my I, if you I, put me up I, there though there wouldn't be any room for nate that's a thin I, wall <laughs> I will bear with my up. <laughs> well i'll use two walls john thank you i require two walls and i'll put nate on the third <laughs> no, I'm kidding. okay good picks amos even though i gave you trouble about your picks you always, okay. you always come up with picks at the very last responsible moment. But are they good ones? Sometimes. Sometimes. <laughs> All right. My pick this episode is a TEDx talk from Adam Tornhill. It's called Code Crime Complexity, Analyzing Software with Forensic Psychology. It's a quick TED talk, just like most of them are. It's about 15 minutes long. 
And if, if you like the, if you like that Ted talk, he's also written a book in the pragmatic programmer series that further explores this concept. Hmm. Um, so it might be, might be something for Wes to even look into with this, uh, analysis and taking a hard look at code using some forensic techniques. I thought that was very interesting. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. I'll check that out. All right, guys. Well, that is our show. So uh, Wes, once again, I want to thank you, Wes Higby, for being on the show with us today and for talking to us about Commitment to Value and your book by the same title, Commitment to Value, How to Make Technical Projects Worthwhile. If people would like to get in touch with you, Wes, to continue this conversation or to see if maybe they can build some trust with you and start a working relationship with you, Wes, how would people go about contacting you? Uh, absolutely. Thanks for having me again. Uh, glad to be here. If people want to reach out, weshigby.com. Uh, if uh, you mess that up in Google, I think it'll get it right for you. And you should be able to find a way to get a hold of me there. Good old Google. Yep. Get you out of every, get you out of every problem. <laughs> Fixes every problem. <laughs> awesome. All right. That's all we have time for today. Be sure to check out our website, thisagilelife.com for our show notes and for the link to Wes's book, and for all of our past episodes. Thanks for listening, and keep living this Agile life. This Agile life is brought to you by a community of Agile developers and coaches aspiring to spread the word about this groundbreaking approach to software development. Join us at thisagilelife.com forward slash community.